Hey everybody, today is Mardi Gras, and that means Fat Tuesday, the day before Lent begins. And if you live in some towns in Louisiana, say New Orleans area, you probably think of Mardi Gras as a day of debauchery. But I want to take a look at the true meaning of Mardi Gras, the true meaning of feasting, the true meaning of fasting, and how all of these mysteries, feasting and fasting, are Christian realities that are meant to lead us to the ultimate celebration, the eternal feast, the wedding feast of heaven. So Mardi Gras originated as a day before Lent begins uh, to eat some fatty foods, to, you know, Fat Tuesday, to eat some fatty foods to celebrate before the time of penance, almsgiving, fasting, and prayer of Lent, right? So how did it become such a debauchery? Uh, you know, if you're thinking of Mardi Gras in the New Orleans sense of Mardi Gras, where there's all kinds of... Go back to my video. Uh, so we're talking about Mardi Gras. How did it become a, a feast of debauchery? Um, and what do we mean by feast in the Christian sense of the word? A lot of themes here. Let me see if I can unpack them. Here's what I want to say. A materialistic world seeks to aim our desire at all of its consumer goods rather than aiming our desire at the all-consuming good. Let me say that again. Very important. A materialistic world seeks to aim our desire at all of its consumer goods rather than aiming it at the all-consuming good. Pause right there. We all have this ache, we all have this hunger, we all have this need for fulfillment. And if that desire for fulfillment, for pleasure, for happiness is not aimed at our ultimate all-consuming good, which is God, well then we're going to be looking for God's substitutes, right? If our desire for celebration and partying and fulfillment is not aimed at the ultimate celebration, the ultimate party, the ultimate feast, which is heaven, we're going to turn those desires towards false celebrations, false infinities, right? So all the pleasures of this world that God created are meant to be signs that point us to the ultimate pleasure. But when we don't understand the things of this world as so many signs that point us to an ultimate pleasure and ultimate fulfillment, the danger is we start to look to the pleasures of this world to be our ultimate fulfillment. And that's when celebration gets morphed into debauchery. A true feast, a true party, a true celebration here on planet Earth is meant to be a sign and a foreshadowing of something greater. That's the meaning of Christian feasts. To celebrate the good things of this world Understanding that the good things of this world are meant to point us to our ultimate good, right? But when we lose sight of that ultimate good, we expect the things of this world to be ultimate pleasure and things get really distorted, twisted up, and debauched, right? But we as Christians, we must not throw out the baby with the bathwater because even if Mardi Gras has gotten all twisted up, there's something still good in there that we can reclaim and help it to point us and allow it to help it allow it to help us point in the direction of heaven that's the purpose of true celebrations but why fasting right because here's here's the danger the catechism says this it says the danger of sacramental reality what does that mean the danger of a world and all its pleasures that are meant to point us to another world that's sacramental reality the pleasures of this world pointing us to another world. Uh, the pleasures of this world being a kind of foreshadowing of eternity, right? The danger of that is idolatry. The danger of that is that we expect the foreshadowing, which is indeed so pleasurable and God made it that way. Think of sex, for example, right? Why is sex the number one idol in all of human history? Because it's the number one idol icon in the biblical vision of reality. Yes, indeed. 
The Bible from beginning to end uses the love of man and woman and the two becoming one flesh as the main icon that's meant to point us to heaven, right? But when we lose sight of heaven, the icon becomes an idol. When we lose sight of the fact that sex, for example, is meant to point us to something greater, we aim our desire for the infinite joy, the infinite pleasure at the finite reality of sex and what we have is idolatry, and when we have idolatry, we have debauchery. And that kind of debauchery almost always gets mixed up with food and alcohol. What's being mocked in a frat party? What's being mocked at the debauch celebrations of Mardi Gras? What's being mocked is the glory and the celebration of the wedding feast of Cana, which is the feast that points us to the eternal wedding feast of Christ and the church. All good things, all things created are good, put it that way. And the devil does not have his own clay, which means all he can do is take God's clay and twist it up. So when you see something debauched, what you're seeing is something good that's gotten twisted up and distorted. Christianity does not throw those things away. Christianity untwists them so that they can redirect our hearts towards ultimate fulfillment. Again, let me say it this way. The world and all of its pleasures are good. We have to reclaim this as Christians. To say otherwise is Manichaeism, a heresy. It's puritanical ridiculousness. The created world is good, right? All the celebration, the rightful celebrations of the goodness of the created world are good, and they're meant to point us to heaven. But when we lose sight of heaven, the pleasures of this world become our heaven, and when the pleasures of this world become our heaven, we end in debauchery. We could also put it this way. I write about this in my book, Fill These Hearts. We all have some kind of pleasure principle. And when we think that Christianity is that kind of puritanical or Manichaean rejection of the world, we think Christianity wants to starve us, right? We think Christianity is a starvation diet. That's how I write about it in my book, Fill These Hearts. And so if Christianity is a starvation diet, it's no surprise that the secular world's fast food, the promise of immediate gratification for our hunger, is a lot more attractive than that puritanical, stoic, Manichaean starvation diet. Christianity is not a starvation diet. Christianity is an invitation to the ultimate celebration, the ultimate feast. And so we all have a pleasure principle. Here's what I mean. The starvation diet, here's the starvation diet's pleasure principle. Pleasure is an evil to reject. The fast food approach that immediate gratification of our desires, basically says pleasure is an idol to indulge. But the banquet vision of the world, true Christianity says, pleasure is an icon that's meant to point to heaven. Or we could put it this way, I say in my book, Fill These Hearts. The starvation diet, here's the pleasure principle. If it feels good, it must be sinful. <laughs> the fast food approach, if it feels good, do it. The banquet approach, if it feels good, it's meant to be a preview of coming attractions. Or we could put it this way. The starvation diet negates the world's pleasures. The fast food inflates the world's pleasures. Whereas the true Christian approach, approach the banquet, sublimates the world's pleasures. What does that mean? I go on to say this. When the world's pleasures are sublimated, that means rightly ordered and lifted up or made sublime, they can be seen for what they truly are. So many foreshadowings of heavenly bliss. Then we can rejoice wholeheartedly with St. Bridget of Ireland, for example, who describes heaven as a big lake of beer into which we will dive with holy delight. Now that's a vision of heaven I can get excited about. We can get past our squeamishness and we can rejoice with, rejoice with the prophet Isaiah who describes heaven as where we will all drink from the abundant breast of the new Jerusalem and find comfort in the overflow of her milk. Look it up, Isaiah 66. That's an image of heaven I can rejoice in. 
We can also get beyond prudishness when we have a proper pleasure principle and recognize that the glorious erotic love song, the lovers in the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, that glorious erotic celebration of love is not debauchery. It is a sign that's meant to point us to the eternal embrace of Christ and the church in heaven. My brothers and sisters, this is the point. The world is good. God made it. Food is good. God made it. Wine is good. God made it. How do we rightly rejoice in the good pleasures of this world without falling into the debauchery? This is where fasting comes in. And the Catechism puts it very plainly. We fast during Lent to prepare us for the Easter feast. Let me say that again. We fast during Lent to prepare us for the Easter feast. Only a puritanical Manichaean approach to fasting would believe we fast because food is evil. We fast because food is bad. Uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, uh uh. We fast because the food of this world is a sign of another food, another kind of food, spiritual food, food from heaven. Food from heaven is what really satisfies us. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, here's the glory of Christianity. We don't have the physical world over here and the spiritual world over here. The two have come together, right? Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, guess what? That word of God became flesh And that flesh is offered as food. The bread on the altar, the wine on the altar becomes spiritual food, becomes spiritual drink. Not by rejecting the physical reality, but in and through the physical reality, we have spiritual food, we have spiritual drink. So we fast so as to convince ourselves, number one, that we are not slaves to the pleasure of this world. And we're made for something more than this world has to offer. This is the purpose of fasting. Not to make us think food is bad. Not to make us think our bodies are bad. But to get us in touch with our deeper hungers and our deeper thirsts. And to orient us towards the true feast. The Easter feast. The feast of resurrected life. The feast of the Eucharist. That's what we're talking about. The Eucharist is the true feast. The Eucharist is bread come down from heaven. And this is why the Sundays, even during the time of Lent, are not days of fasting. They're not officially days of Lent, right? Because every Sunday is meant to be a feast. Every Sunday is meant to be a celebration of resurrection. My brothers and sisters, keep this in mind also as we enter Lent. There are 40 days of Lent but 50 days of Easter. So where's the emphasis? The emphasis is not on the fasting. The emphasis is on the feasting. But I conclude with this thought. As we have our Mardi Gras, as we have our Fat Tuesday and prepare to enter Lent tomorrow, I conclude with this thought. Only those who fast know how to feast. Very important. And only those who feast know how to fast. There is a rhythm here. If we are always feasting, guess what? We're never feasting. If we are always fasting, guess what? We're never fasting because it's what we're always doing. It's the rhythm of feasting and fasting that allows us to properly experience both. Only those who properly fast know how to properly feast. So as you enter this Lent, pray for me and I will pray for you that instead of going in begrudgingly and instead of gorging ourselves on Fat Tuesday because tomorrow we have to start our fast, rather let's enter into Lent with the proper Christian attitude in understanding the goodness of this created world, the goodness of food, the goodness of wine, the goodness of celebrating, Why do we fast? 
to prepare us for the feast. Let's enter this Lent with an attitude of, Lord, teach me how to fast, not begrudgingly. Teach me how to fast this Lent so that I can truly, over the 50 days of Easter, I can truly, truly feast and celebrate in the right way and celebrate the right things in a way that my heart is oriented towards the resurrected life, towards the life that you promise us in our resurrection. If we don't have our sights set on the next life as ultimate fulfillment, the danger is we're going to look to this life as ultimate fulfillment and we will be disillusioned and we will end in despair. What is our hope? Our hope is this world points us to another world. Rejoice in all the beautiful things of this world, but do not set your sights on them. The resurrection, the resurrected life is where we must set our sights. St. Paul says it very clearly. He says, if the resurrection is not real, then all you get is the pleasures of this world. If the resurrection is not real, eat and drink and party like the rest of the world because this is all you got. But my brothers and sisters, the party that awaits us in the next life, <laughs> the best we get in this world is just a little, 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 little glimmer of the party that awaits us in the next life. A truly Catholic, universal party. A throw-down celebration that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. What's Mardi Gras in the true sense of the word? Fat Tuesday has become debauchery. Why? Because we don't have our sights set on the ultimate party that the Lord wants to give us. Lord, give us faith that you really want to satisfy the deepest desires of our heart. As we enter Lent, teach us to fast, to prepare us for the ultimate feast, your resurrection. Peace, my brothers and sisters. A few shout outs here to Kaylee, uh, Kaylee Schwalbe. Am I saying that correctly? God bless you, Kaylee. Uh, Manuel Alfonso, God bless you. Mario uh, on Antonius, God bless you. Uh, Robin Hannah Hungerman, God bless you. Christabel, hey Christabel, how you doing? Eve, Tisha, God bless you. Please join your prayers to the 40 days campaign against abortion. Lord, 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 teach us, teach us, teach us who we really are. Why do we have abortion in the world? Because we don't know who we are and we don't know the meaning of sex and we don't know the meaning of life and we don't know the meaning of love. Let us unite our fast for that intention. Good idea. Cha, 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 pray for us and marriage Retorno CPR. Will do. Rebecca Rogers. Thank you, Christopher. You are welcome, Rebecca. God bless you. Eric French. Hey, Eric. Peace back to you. Hello again, Kaylee. Everybody, I thank you for joining me on this Mardi Gras Tuesday, Fat Tuesday. Prepare your hearts for the Feast of Easter by entering into a proper fast this Lent. Be not afraid to fast. It prepares us for the feast. Peace out for now. Take care.